Is that how you say it? Gould? Said it right. I mean, That's right. I'm normally Gould. the guy saying the name the wrong way. You nailed so that. I nailed it. I'm really proud of you for that. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to have you with us. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be with you guys. Looking forward yeah, to so our we conversation. read your book, Cultural Apologetics. I think back in 2020. Yeah, back in 2020. Um, and we're actually working on a kind of an online evangelism project that we had kind of started and really use that to just kind of help frame the way we were thinking about um, what this could and should look like. Yeah. And in many ways, what we're doing now is morphed from yes, that. So the outgrowth of that. Um, yeah. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's super encouraging to hear. I want yeah. to hear more, but I um, love it. So I guess let's let's start off. Give us a bit about your background, because you would consider yourself, you're a professor, you're a philosopher, a theologian, apologist. So maybe talk about how that started and then what brought you into this idea of really exploring cultural apologetics. Yeah. So I think I can do all that um, in a fairly succinct way, but um, so I uh, became a Christian in college through Campus Crusade for Christ, or as I go mm -hmm. now as crew. And um, since God got a hold of my life as a college student, I had a real heart for working with college students too. And so after graduating, I graduated actually in accounting. I was a CPA for like right out of school. Um, but then we joined staff with crew. And I realized in my evangelism, I, I, in trying to share about Jesus with others, I always veered toward the intellectual types or those who at least thought they were intellectuals. And I love to have like conversations about Jesus and the gospel in the context of ideas. And, and so suddenly, you know, as a former undergrad accounting major, I have all these questions about the faith and how do you defend the truth of Christianity and things like that. And so I describe it as like this new passion for learning that was surfacing in, in my heart. But because as a campus minister, you're kind of like a generalist. I don't know if you guys relate to this as pastors too, but like you're, you're good at everything, but not <laughs> excellent at anything, you know? Um, but like, I didn't have any time to really pursue these passions for learning. And so I describe it as like this beach ball that I shoved under the surface of my life for three years. And as you can imagine with the metaphor, that beach ball would continue to kind of surface mm -hmm. and I'd shove it down and it would surface. And finally, about three years into this role as a campus minister, I began to like wrestle with God, what about these passions to learn and to know? In this case, it was like apologetics, theology, philosophy. And I kind of let that beach ball hover on the surface of my life and, um, you know, began to like teach our students in the ministry about apologetics, learn some things about myself that I have abilities to communicate, learn some things about uh, our students that they had real needs and wanting to learn the truth of these, you know, of Christianity in that way and defending the faith. And so from there, um, did, began to do other things related to apologetics, did these open forums. Like every week we'd go into a dorm and say like, hey, here's Christianity, you know, in like three minutes. And then like, what are your questions? And we spend like hours talking wow. apologetic questions. And I can remember, you know, walking out of these dorms every week at like 1 a.m., totally alive. Like my heart, my soul, my mind, everything was on fire. And so all the, long story short, from that, God just sort of began to move me in the direction of becoming like a niche player niche player, whatever the word is, in the kingdom of God. Um, and so from there, I went to seminary, actually Talbot School yep, cool. of Theology in LA, and uh, did the philosophy degree there and fell in love with that, realized how central philosophy is to defending the faith and un understanding the goodness, truth, and beauty of the gospel. From there, I went to Purdue University, did a PhD um, in philosophy, now still with crew, still doing ministry, but now just kind of at a different level. Um, and there, though, one of the real fun things about being a graduate student in philosophy is you get to teach undergraduates. And so I began teaching like intro to philosophy classes or intro to ethics classes. And I realized there, like, oh, this is how God has made me. Like, it's in the classroom that my heart sings and, and, and things like that. And just walking out of every day with like an extra step in my, you know. Mm -hmm. Pep in your pep, step. Yeah, pep in your step, um, right? <laughs> That's it. Yes. I always mix my metaphors, but uh, yeah, a little pep in my step. So from there, like God just confirmed uh, you know, that <laughs> this was it. And then I'll just fast forward to, yeah, how did we get to this? Um, fast forward a couple more years. Now I'm teaching in a seminary in Texas and um, was asked to develop an MA in, in apologetics degree. And one of those classes, I'm like, hey, um, we should have a class on cultural apologetics. That sounded like something really important. Um, and of course, when you have the idea, you end up doing it. And so I ended up being assigned to teach that class. Um, and so I did like what every educator does who doesn't know anything about a topic because I Googled, this is like eight years ago, I Googled like, what is cultural apologetics? And mm -hmm. there's nothing there. You know, there's, there's like a couple of answers to this question on, on, online. Uh, 
So basically what I did that first year teaching this class was I just gathered like seven books that I was really interested in that are at the intersection of the gospel culture and apologetics and used it like as a research seminar for me, even though, you know, teaching students. The next year I swapped out those seven books, swapped in seven new ones. And I did that, I think three or four years. And then finally, after about three or four years is when I began to sort of develop like, oh, okay, this is what I think, you know, this is. And, and that's where the book kind of came from. But really the question that animates that book has been the question that's animated my Christian life since I became a Christian in college. And, and that's the question, how does the gospel get a fair hearing in our culture? And so that's really, and I'm wrestling for that for myself, for the sake of our culture now. But I mean, I'm even thinking about my kids and my kids' kids and the future of the gospel and all that. So anyway, I, I, that's I went great. on for a while, but that's the, that's the. So your passion initially started out more around uh, traditional apologetics and then over time morphed into a deeper passion for apologetics from the cultural perspective? Yes. Um, at first it was like, just how do, what is the truth about, or how do we respond to the problem <laughs> of evil or how do we defend, uh, you know, that Jesus rose from the dead or what is this deal about evolution or whatever? And those are all still really important questions and questions that really um, I'm deeply interested in. I mean, my, my day job is a philosopher, so I love playing with propositions. I love arguments. But on the other hand, I think this campus ministry background uh, I've, I've never, even though just those questions really animate me, I've also just never left the desire to connect it to right. like where people live. And I've just realized that we're not all walking right. bobbly heads, you know, as they say, but we've got passions and longings yeah. and desire and, you know, all, all these things in there. And I've just, I just, I think, you know, I wrote this book with the title Cultural Apologetics, but in many ways, that's just how I view apologetics, right? right? Like we want to engage all mm -hmm. of the human person in making the case that Christianity is not just true, but good and beautiful. Does that so, yeah, grow out of, kind of you talked about uh, how you would walk into dorm rooms and explain the gospel in a few minutes and then field a bunch of questions. I imagine that a, a large amount of those questions were having more to do with what does that have to do with my life and the choices that I make than it did, you know, things about the problem of evil or the fine tuning of the universe or stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I think it's so it, it definitely has a lot to do. Like most of those conversations initially were, um, you know, just kind of like the standard questions. What about the problem of evil, you know, and so on. But the minute mm -hmm. you go beyond that and follow up with the student, you know, the next day or the next week, it very quickly comes to, well, why do you think wh why do you struggle with the question of God? And as it turns out, it's not merely an intellectual worry. It, it maybe has something to do with like a bad father figure. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking of personal mm -hmm. conversations I've had or, you know, all these other factors, too. And so that's where I just became convinced in in not disengaging apologetics from actually speaking mm -hmm. to a real live person, taking time to listen and actually hear what their real worries and objections are. So, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's it's both. But but it always goes deeper than merely right. the intellectual mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Talk about um, and I think this is this really is kind of the part of the book that made a lot of sense to me. You talk about uh, New Begin's experience going to India. Um, and how he came back and began explaining what he calls like a missionary encounter, right? So he asked the question, what would be involved in a missionary encounter between the gospel and this whole way of perceiving, thinking, and living what we call modern Western culture? How have things changed in culture as we get further from being in a uh, Christian society? Essentially, what you're saying is, how do we rethink what that gospel message is? Maybe talk about that and even just that story and how that really inspired you as a launching pad for your book. Yeah, I think that particular quote and then the book of which it's a part um, are very much at the background of, of my book. Um, so Leslie Newbegin was a missionary from Great Britain to India, let, was sent from Great Britain maybe in the 1930s, I forget, 36, 34, something like that. Spent 40 years faithfully ministering to the Hindus, comes back to Great Britain after 40 years in the early 70s, only to realize at the time that the time he was away, his own sending country had become, as he would call it, post-Christian. And so he begins to ask that question, you know, what would what would be involved in a genuine missionary encounter between the gospel and this sort of new way of thinking and living and perceiving that we call modern Western culture? And so he wrote this book called The Foolishness to the Greeks. And what I love about New Begin, I mean, there's so many things, but two that are, are sort of in the background of my own thinking are one, like, you know, New Begin understood that. So like if the ultimate question that we want to ask every single person on the face of the earth is what do you make of Jesus Christ? Right. Like that's the question we want before every person's heart and mind to answer. But Newbegin understood that that's, there's this penultimate question 
which is that that question that you read that that quote that that question he asked on the first page of his book you know what would be involved in this genuine missionary encounter um and the reason why that's so important and this is the second thing about new begin is he understood that like culture like the gospel is never proclaimed in a vacuum right that every culture we find ourselves in has like this collective mindset that in, uh, that you know of beliefs that inform what's plausible and implausible they, they have this collective conscience that informs you know what's considered the good and what's considered right. And then they have this collective like imagination that, that, you know, way of conceiving themselves in the world and all of those things inform the receptivity to the gospel. And so the way that I've sort of boiled that down is, you know, that, that today in the West, and I'm sure this isn't just in the West, but at least in the West, you know, Christianity has this image problem because for many people, Christianity is viewed as either unreasonable or undesirable or both. Right. And that's really new begin. Uh, that's that's the way that he sort of um, postures his this question. And I find that such a helpful question. Uh, yeah. In an ever involving. I think it's easy uh, to um, understand why some people might consider Christianity unreasonable. It is, in fact, founded upon the belief that a man rose from the dead. Um, why do you think culture, though, finds Christianity undesirable? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and more it seems like more and more as we go. Um, part of that's our fault, I think, as Christians and the church. Um, and I, I talk about this in the book where uh, I think some of the reasons lie at our feet with respect to like, we become very largely anti-intellectual mm -hmm. as the church. And so we no longer have a, a, a robust theology, for mm -hmm. example, of the body um, and what it means to be embodied humans that, that love God mm -hmm. with all of our being. Uh, we no longer have a rich theology of beauty. So we don't know what its place and role. And so we've, we've basically seceded beauty to Hollywood or to mm -hmm. the art museums, but you know, it's very rarely in the church, except maybe auditory beauty when it comes to singing. Um, we, you know, we were fragmented people, you know, weekly we read of Christian leaders that disqualify themselves from ministry. And so if you kind of boil all that down, um, you know, if the church historically was called upon to play this prophetic mm -hmm. role in culture to be the salt and light to, you know, a decaying and die, dark world, well, we're no longer able to fulfill mm. that role um, because we're, we're fragmented and nobody wants to hear from us. And if you add to that, the third thing is that we, as I would put it in the book, like we've got this, I call it this like unbaptized imagination, or we become just as disenchanted as the world. If you add to that, that we, namely the church, us as Christians, largely view the world the same way everyone else does. And what I mean by that is we, we use language like the world is everyday or ordinary or mundane. But that's that's a very disenchanted and a historical way of looking at reality, right? Because the the traditional view is the sacramental view of the world, where mm -hmm. everything is a gift and everything is mm -hmm. infused with love and mystery and beauty and goodness because it's created by a, a good God. And so we've kind of lost all that. Yeah, just to so interrupt like, you there for one all, second, a lot of I find that us. that's true. Like even in like really small ways. Like last night, I was outside barbecuing and my son was shooting hoops on our basketball goal. And our neighbor came out and we're kind of like talking to each other over the back fence. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how are you doing? Classic, just moment, classic American moment. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm like, how are you totally. doing? He's like, oh, you know, yeah, pretty good. we're hanging in there. And my response is like, oh, us too. Mm. Like that's, yeah. and I immediately yep. thought like, oh, that was so lame. <laughs> like I'm, I'm actually doing more than hanging <laughs> in there. Like I'm, I'm pretty grateful for the yeah. life that we have and, um, and, and how exactly. I should be viewing reality through the lens of the gospel. And it was, it was kind of a lie, mm. like just kind of based out of, I, I think there's this, right. this nature in us that feels like we have to, at least in me, where like there's an agreeability in my spirit where I want to kind of just be on the same plane as everybody mm -hmm. that I encounter. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. You, that made me think of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I, I do the same thing. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> you were saying. So yeah, I guess, so part of it's laid at our feet. And then, then of course, you know, part of it's the culture's moved mm. on um, in, in very many ways from like traditional Christian ethic. So we're often viewed in terms of um, whether it's gender or sexuality or marriage, you know, where the, we're the, the traditional Christian view is now viewed as archaic or unrepressive uh, and so on. And all of that's related to like these huge sort of tectonic shifts mm -hmm. in culture um, and the way that culture understands mm -hmm. its place in the universe. And some of that's our fault for not, again, 
articulating a robust mm -hmm. and attractive mm -hmm. view of the world. And some of it's our fault in terms of not living according to that robust and attractive view of the world. And then some of it's just the fact that we live in a world that's fallen sure. and broken and under the spirits of the you know, kingdom of darkness. Could you talk about some too. of those uh, tectonic shifts? Yeah. Um, let's see. Probably the – so there, there's a number of ways to get at it. One way is to think about some shifts in terms of the mm -hmm. history of ideas. And mm -hmm. I can just give you three that I talk about in the book that are kind of great important shifts. Oh, uh, you know what? These might be too much, but like um, I'm kind of thinking in terms of. Go ahead. Let me yeah. just give you one. So, so let me give you. Let me do do it two ways. Here's one um, shift, um, in terms of the way we view the world. Like so, so for the first 1500 views of the uh, years years mm -hmm. of the church, there is kind of this. Um, dominant way of viewing the church such that the the earthly realities were existed in virtue of these mm -hmm. heavenly realities right so it's called this sacramental view of the world or this enchanted view of the world such that you know there's god and the sacred order and then everything here on earth this natural order points to and illuminates the divine and and things like that but they're mm -hmm. deeply connected so there there's just you know um like so, there's this tight mm -hmm. connection then I, I should say between the sacred order and the natural order. So one tectonic shift has been the severing of that tight connection between the two orders. So at first you have the severing of the two, and then you know post enlightenment you have not just the severing of the two, but this claim that mm -hmm. there is no upper world, there is mm -hmm. no transcendent world, the spiritual realm. And so now we live in like what Charles Taylor and all these philosophers would say, the mm -hmm. imminent frame. There's mm -hmm. just the mundane. There's just, you know, the, the iron cage of the physical universe. There's nothing beyond the world. So there, there's a lot of um, intellectual history behind that claim that I can unpack if you want. But the other way to think that's but that's a quick way to show like the ideational shift. Another way to think about it just in terms of spiritual um, terms, though, is I always just go back to Romans 1. And, you know, we've got Romans 118 where uh, it talks about, you know, the first thing that we do in our wickedness mm -hmm. is suppress mm -hmm. the truth about God. And then from there, we have this kind of emptying of the mm -hmm. world that takes place where it becomes less and less sacred, mm -hmm. less and less full of life and beauty and mystery and deity or what, you know, divinity or whatever. Um, and so what happens, though, I always go back to this quote by A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite, like, devotional books. He wrote this book called The Knowledge of the Holy. And in there, the first... Uh, line in that book is something like, and just paraphrasing, he says, like, the most important thing about you is what comes mm -hmm. to mind when you think about God. And the minute we begin to suppress the truth about who God is, and, and he says, and then he goes on to say, and if you get that right, if you get your idea of God wrong, everything right. goes downhill from there. And I think there's something like that tendency. And you see that pattern in Romans 1, right? We suppress the truth about God. And by the time you get to the end of, you know, the passage, there's... um you know, worshiping idols and there's foolishness and blindness and ungratitude and all these things that take that's, place. So there's kind of a yeah, spiritual that's really interesting. Like too. I often think about this kind of stuff as it relates to just daily life. And it's hard to separate that from um, like political thought and um, things along that vein, right? So like when I think about systems of uh, politics that then inform policies and how societies operate. To me, it would seem that a Christian should be highly wary of any system that is rooted in godlessness. Just as you said, if we have the yeah. wrong idea right. about God, and one of those wrong ideas certainly is that there is no God, then right. no system of thought can flow from that that is true. And therefore, it can't play itself out in society and in life-giving ways. I've often caught in that tension, you know, as a Christian, or, yeah. where uh, what role and responsibility do we have to help, it, for lack of a better term, Christianize society for no other reason other than yeah. we believe that the Christianization of society is what will lead to the flourishing of society. I'm not a, I'm not a post-millennialist, mm -hmm. and I'm not a exactly. utopian. Uh, I'm not a fan of utopian ideals, but there's some kind of tension there where there has to be some exploration of that. Yeah, you're right. And, and it is a, it is a difficult question, right? Um, like, I mean, like we, you know, there's a relationship between culture and politics. Most people, and I tend to agree with this, but I think it's not quite this simple that, you know, there's this phrase that culture's upstream mm -hmm. from politics. And so if you don't like your politics, you got to go upstream a little and see what's going to on. To the universities. The cultural yeah, right. level. <laughs> That, exactly. And the the grand stuff. Yeah. I know it goes both ways. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yeah, and so it's complicated, right? Because culture is complicated, and it's not purely logical. Many commentators have pointed that out too. So it's like it, it, it's really hard to change. And so the question becomes not one of, of course, we can't. Well, you know, it just becomes this question of faithfulness, and and, and what does it mean to live faithfully for this for the flourishing of all, mm -hmm. and the love of God and man in mm -hmm. the midst of this kind of all in, always imperfect cultural structures mm -hmm. that we find ourselves in. It becomes complicated and and hard for sure, and that's why. Last thing, um, Christian wisdom and the virtues become so important, right? Because, um, you know, the ancients were concerned with like this virtue of wisdom is the idea that we understand the grain of the universe and the world. And then we live our lives according to that. And that takes real practical judgment and wisdom um, that we let connect to you. Um, so. James uh, Smith's the uh, what is it? You are what you love. Where he talks about virtue being habit mm. and um yeah, and so that's right. I guess yeah. to connect back to what we're saying, right. I always go back to only the gospel has the power to transform people's hearts. Only a transformed heart is going to have any passion or desire whatsoever to pursue a new habit. And only renewed habits are going to lead to the transformation of society. So it, as cliche as it might sound, it does come down to the gospel going to work in the heart. This then brings back the purpose of the church. Um, yeah, that's where I land anyway. So this is something that I, I've been thinking about, like, you know, how do we go about the task as Christians like mm -hmm. to say of world mm -hmm. change, you know, um, is it, do we just change enough individual hearts through capturing the gospel and we kind of trickle up mm -hmm. to change culture? Um, that's mm -hmm. kind of the common view, you know, the bottom up approach, change, change individual lives and you change culture. But I've been convinced by James um, Davidson Hunter. He wrote this book mm -hmm. called to change the world. Uh, 2010, I think, book. But he argues that it's always the other way around. It's always top down. Um, and so I actually think it's an interplay of both. But his point was that culture always changes from the top down, namely culture shaping mm -hmm. institutions of the world, because those are the ones that get to define what reality is, right? So think of the university, you know, the people with the PhD behind their um, names get to tell us the truth about reality, right? Um, and so on. And, and so I think there's something to that as well that we've got to factor into our theology of culture and mission and gospel. Um, what's interesting, let me tell you a big miss in the book. I have a few misses. If you press me, I'll tell you what they are. Um, one miss was, and this represents a weak ecclesiology on my part, and that's why I'm really interested to talk to you and hear what you guys think about this. But um, I wrote this book, you know, arguing that we need to engage culture like at the at the culture shaping level, you know, that's in the heavy, uh, you know, with the truth of the goodness, beauty of the gospel, and then everything trickles down from there and we'll change culture and so on. Um, and I talked of three culture shaping institutions, um, the university with respect to truth, the arts with respect to beauty, and then like the city mm -hmm. with respect to goodness. There's but a, what I missed missing. out, and I think this is a huge <laughs> mess, is the church, yes. right? And, I, and then one day after the book's published, I was actually reading in my devotional, I was reading Ephesians 3, the 10, where, wisdom you know, of Paul God. says, you know, yes. the wisdom of God through to reveal church. the mystery of Christ through the church. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I just missed like, and of course, but if you press me, I'd always say, yes, this has got to be a culture shaping institution. But um, yeah. yeah, so big miss. So I, I hope to write a sequel there you go. and I'm going to. I'm going to I interact that. with that. We'll definitely that read question. it. We're, we're big fans of your work. Yeah. And I, I tend to agree. I think the interplay between yeah. top down and bottom up is spot on because yeah. the fact is that the top down won't be worth anything good if, if the people at the top aren't formed into the nature of Christ, uh, you know, which is, I guess, right. the, the bottom up or inside out maybe is better um, way of, of right. thinking about it. Yeah. And I think the, the whole deal with the church um, – is it uh, Eugene Peterson in the message where he says that the, the church is not peripheral to the world, the world is peripheral to the church? That's a cool idea. Right. And I do think that yeah. when the church is really being effective, it should expect to see the people who belong to that local church going out into society, making a difference, using their gifts. And it should expect to see uh, pushback and persecution. I think depending upon what your eschatology mm -hmm. is, like I'm a big fan of, do you know who Sam Storms is? I'm a big fan of his uh, yeah. of his work, and we had him on the podcast recently. And I think the way he said it was really good. That he expects, uh, as time continues to go, he expects to see a heightened increase in the impact of the church upon the world, and a simultaneous heightened increase of demonic attack against the church, which plays yeah. itself out in terms of yeah, culture. That sounds so right. I think it's both in, mm -hmm. um, and but I don't think that should stop the yeah. church from pressing into the call of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. I want to 
just get you to explain really briefly and practically the difference between um, traditional, like like with some specific examples, traditional apologetics and cultural apologetics. Um, early on when we were actually in the early days of talking about building out this thing called BAST, one of the things that we came across that was really confronting, again, both as local church pastors who are always encouraging people to, you know, share your faith, bring a friend to church, share, you know, and and it was, I'm going to butcher this statistic, but it was something like 70% of church going millennials think that it is extreme mm. to share your faith. Mm -hmm. um, extreme. Extreme. Right. Mm -hmm. And and then it was sort of like confronting this idea of like the the age old like there's a god size hole in your heart yeah. that only God can fill, and how that's the way we've been preaching and talking about the gospel for the last you know couple hundred years, and now we have an entire generation of people that don't actually think there's a hole in their heart in the first place. <laughs> so we're kind of talking it to completely yeah. different. Um, that's the most practical way I think of maybe the difference between tra traditional apologetics and cultural apologetics. Um, so maybe just talk about the difference there. Yeah, that's really good. That's an important question. Um, I think traditional apologetics is usually defined as some sort of rational defense of the faith and emphasis being the adjective rational. And so you'll, you'll see like a good example of this would be like a William Lane Craig, you know, doing impre incredibly important work. He's a friend of mine. Um, many people still walk this lane. It's a, it's a, it's a, a plank on building bridges from the gospel that's well-trodden and it ought to be right. Cause tr Christianity is true. We need to defend that. Um, so that would be probably what's understood as traditional apologetics, just defending through our uh, rational arguments, the reasonableness of faith. And I would want to say, and I just want to be very clear here, any cultural apologetic worth its salt mm -hmm. ought to engage the rational right. defense of the faith that right. has to be part of it. So that's, that's right. the first thing I want to say. But the second thing I would want to say is, but wait a minute, there's so much more involved in defending the faith, right? There's objections to the goodness of Christianity. You know, the God of the Old Testament is a moral monster. Christians are hypocrites. The church isn't good for the world. You know, all this evil done in the name of God and so on. And then there's, there's objections to the beauty of the gospel in Jesus, uh, you know, doesn't satisfy the deep longings of the heart for identity and meaning and purpose and so on. And so I think that a cultural apologet, so I, I would want to make a distinction between like, um, you know, sometimes people speak, speak of different lanes like rational apologetics, philosophical apologetics, scientific apologetics, imaginative apologetics, moral apologetics. I would want to put all those in one lane and I want to claim a, a completely separate lane for cultural apologetics that is inclusive of all those, but yet takes um, and embeds our apologetic efforts into two things, what it means to be human and what it means to be humans that are part of culture that are shaped by culture and that shape culture. And so that's going to involve then a, a, a theory or a theology or a philosophy of culture, this kind of local global idea, you know, the mm -hmm. culture shaping institutions versus the downstream mm. and all of that too. So it's just going to enfold all the traditional stuff in my view, at least how I conceive it in kind of a much wider, um, a much, a much wider framework. Is that, is yeah, that I guess a little to bit? do otherwise would be to fall victim to that sacred natural split that we don't, adhere to right is that kind of similar yeah. to like the francis Schaeffer yeah. or like the nancy piercy fact value well not not i mean um yeah maybe a little bit but i'm not necessarily worried because even there those are epistemological worries um you know that you know you have objective facts and then you have subjective values and so yeah i think most traditional apologists would want to reject that as well and I just want to reject that too and say, even so, there's much, there's many more epistemic resources available to us in making the case. Um, and some of those are rational arguments, but some of them are the type of lives that we live and the kind of beauty that moves us and things like that. And so we've got to incorporate Maybe that too. Maybe it would be helpful to get like yeah. a bit more specific there in terms of what you mean by that. Like, help, help me to be compelled by making a cultural apologetic to, to my neighbor for why they should consider following Jesus. So, um, Sorry to put okay, you on the spot. let's see. So one thing, um, I guess the way that I, I think about it is, you know, I, the example of Paul in um, Mars Hill, where you see him basically do three things. You see him identify a starting place in a culture unlike his own. And for him, 
in Acts chapter 17, it was like this, the fact that all these idols, these, they, 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 if, um, Athenians worship these idols to the unknown God. So he's identifying that as a starting place, you know, this sort of religious impulse to worship that which is ultimate. And from that starting place, he builds a bridge to, to Jesus and the gospel um, by basically outflanking their thinking and then confronting their rank idolatry and things like that. But um, in the same way, I would want to identify starting places in our Athens. And the three that I think are most sort of the best place to start are these the universal longings that every human has in any culture you find yourselves in for goodness, truth, and beauty, right? So the longing for truth, the reason is the, the part of our humanity that is on a quest for truth. Um, our conscience is on a quest for goodness. And then our imagination is on a quest for beauty. And so th these are like three planks on a bridge that we can use to build a bridge from our culture to Jesus and the gospel. And my claim is that the first plank, the plank of reason is a well-walked plank, but we don't do so well walking the other ones. So like, think about the plank of beauty. Why don't we, like C.S. Lewis, tell stories um, or engage the imagination as we engage in arguments, you know, through story, through song, through, through poetry, through whatever it is. Like we own art, right? Because God is the source of all beauty. And so why not incorporate that and make and do and make our case making beautiful or, or, or so on like that or something like that. Um, so is that, that's kind of what I'm thinking, but that might not be what you're asking. So is uh, that, yeah, yeah. Did it get, is that, just simply Christians being involved in the arts, songwriting? Is it more than that? It could be. Yeah, it could be, but I, th I do want it to be more than that. So I'm thinking of like um, in our case making, doing it with beauty in mind, um, you know, doing it with goodness in mind and, of course, truth as well. And so it could be just that we give the same kinds of arguments, but we learn to engage the imagination. You know, this is what Lewis did so well, like in his apologetic work. Think of mere Christianity. You know, the, the whole book begins with, I think it begins with two people quarreling, right? Something that we all understand. So he engages our imagination, pulls us into this story, and then begins to build this argument, the moral argument for God, right, from there. And so there's a there's an interplay of what I would call imaginative reasoning. And so use all that, use all the resources that we have in making the case for Christ. Um, when it comes to goodness, you know, I, I kind of think I parse the longing for goodness in terms of three like sub longings, one a longing for wholeness, one a longing for um, justice, and then one a longing for like significance, a life, you know, bigger than our own. And so in our case making, um, not only live a life that's whole, um, but how do, how do we sort of incorporate this deep longing of the heart in the kind of picture we paint of what it means to be a Christian, you know, and things like that. So maybe this is all sort of a backdrop that informs uh, the way that we present the gospel and the way that we live our lives. Um, mm -hmm. In your book, you talk about, um, well, so much of it is engaging culture, right? So the whole idea is engaging culture, what's happening in culture, how do we weave the story of the gospel in that? Um, you mentioned in your book, uh, about you sort of mentioned Rob Dreer's Benedict Option um, and essentially saying cultural apologetic from a posture of Christ against culture. And you sort of say you find this approach problematic, but I do think it would count as a version of, version of cultural apologetics. In our conversations, when we talk about what does cultural apologetic look like, how do you think we approach that? What does Christ in culture look like? Oftentimes we talk about culture and how we want to like do this. And it's like, well, we don't want to participate in the culture war, right? Like how do we have all of these conversations about what's happening in culture uh, without kind of participating in something that probably isn't very, very helpful. And I'm not saying that Rod Dreher is that, but um, there can be this right. Christ against culture posture. Um, how do we do that? And what is kind of, what's your perspective on, on that? Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So um, a book that's been really helpful, maybe um, maybe you guys have read this, is Andy Crouch's book called Culture Making. No, I've, you read I've, this? I've heard you it guys and I'm familiar, familiar with him, but I have not read that. Okay. So here's the distinction that helps to answer your question. This is, I, I think I would agree with him. He says, so first of all, he just makes a distinction between posture and, and gesture. And postures would be like our, our, our learned second nature, right? Like, you know, so think about like I played tennis growing up as a kid all the way through high school. And so, you know, every time you swing that 
that forehand, your body's learning that stroke, right? And, and that, so every time you gesture, suddenly it becomes second nature. And now even if I pick up a racket, I, I hit that forehand the exact same way I did 20 years ago, you know? Um, and so that's like the distinction. Gesturing is like pointing or just individual acts, but then posture is like our learned stance that mm -hmm. becomes second nature. So with that distinction, Crouch says, hey, here's four postures that Christians shouldn't have. And then here's two that he thinks are right. And I agree with him on the two. He says, at times, Christians have had a posture of condemning culture. Everything's bad. He says, that's not the way we should go. And we, I can go into more, but I'll just list them. The second one is copying culture. We just copy everything. That's our posture. Mm -hmm. He says, we shouldn't do that. Um, we shouldn't just always be critiquing culture and we shouldn't always be, um, oh shoot, there's four C's, copying, critiquing, consuming, you didn't and say condemning. Consuming. consuming. So the four. Got it. Yeah. Consuming. Yeah. Did I get them? I think I got four. Um, okay. So he says, none of those, you can gesture in all those ways, but that shouldn't be our posture toward culture. He says, if we go back to Genesis one and we look at the God who in Genesis one and two is creating and delineating and, and defining and, and cultivating the good, the true and the beautiful and creates this world of beauty and order and abundance. Um, what that tells us is that God is a creating and cultivating God, right? God is an artist and a gardener. And as humans created in the image of the creating and cultivating God, he says that our, our, our posture should be called toward culture should be one of creating that which is good, true, and beautiful and cultivating that in culture that is good, true, and beautiful. That's our posture toward culture, our learn, our learned stance. And then at times we can gesture when appropriate, we condemn, right? When, it, when appropriate, we consume, when appropriate, we critique and when appropriate, we copy, but mm. that's not our posture. That's and good. I think that's, yeah. that's attractive. That, that kind of thinking. Yeah, because even in the act of creating and, uh, cultivating like i think about gardening right sometimes you got to break up the ground and that's kind yeah. of a violent act right like i'm going to take a spade to that hardened soil that maybe that's an, an example of yeah. a gesture but you're not staying there you're just doing something that's necessary to be able to plant the seed right mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. good yeah and you're cultivating something you're nourishing and bringing something new to life that will be good and and, and life-giving right? and i think that's, that's a great really image. helpful mm -hmm. yeah i love that yeah and I will say, oh, just back to your early question, because I, I can't believe I forgot this, but like, how does this actually look, mm -hmm. this cultural apologetics thing? Um, I, I will say maybe the proof will be in the pudding. I, I have a sequel coming out um, okay. in November, and it's a book not about cultural apologetics. It's a book of cultural apologetics written Ooh. for nonbelievers. Oh, and so wow. we'll see what you all think. But I've tried to blend reason and imagination uh, story and just take this reader oh, on a journey that. as we look at 11 features of the world that I think are evocative yes. of the divine. And it's this real attempt to blend in the way that I propose in the cultural apologetics book to blend reason and imagination in such a way that it paints a compelling picture that awakens longing and sets individuals on a journey toward God. So yeah, stay tuned for that. It's called A Good and True Story and it'll be out in November. Um, but maybe that'll help answer that question. What do you mean specifically? Yeah, no. So because it'll be some of the same arguments any other place, but I'm trying to couch yep. them in a way that's. Yep. Do you have compelling. like a, a biggest influence on you when it comes to like the apologist stuff? I do. Yeah. Um, probably no surprise since you've read the book, but it's okay. C.S. Lewis. He's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Let me ask you one more question. What do you, what do you think? And this is putting you on the spot. Oh yeah. I have one more. Go here. You go no, no, first you and can, then, and then no, we'll finish no, on this one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, we always ask our guests this in different, ways what do you think people christians culturally are caring too much about right now and then what do you think culturally we're not caring enough about hmm. okay if you ask <laughs> it that way um initially or pretty quickly i i guess i i would say we're caring too much mm -hmm. about politics um and finding our identity and it doesn't matter if you're beholden to fox news or cnn mm -hmm. it's the same so just to be clear there, I'm not taking a side. I'm just... Um, but if like you were, we're to watch more... one, which would it be? <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Oh, hey, uh, guys, <laughs> yeah. Trump is clearly the root of David. This, okay? this thing changed really quickly. No, anyway, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's good. But just like like the, the kind of anxiety we have, no matter where you are in that spectrum, right? Um, and, and, but wait a minute, like... And the fact that we can't even get along as Christians um, in church, right? We should have something that's way more important than our political affiliation, and that would be Jesus and the gospel. And so it's just really discouraging to see that and the co the consequent behavior online by many Christians. So that, that was the Great. first thing that popped into mind in terms of what we're 
spending too much time on it. in terms of what we could do well or better. I think um, so. I'm encouraged by this actually, but I think that a lot of Christians are in, in the church and, and as well as just that are um, actually doing this are um, becoming awake to the power and importance of beauty and art and story and the imagination to a life of flourishing. And so we're seeing a lot of renewal of mm-hmm. art and beauty in the church. And I think that's super important. Like if, you know, one of my favorite quotes from Augustine's Confessions is in book three. This is a a, a work of, I guess, one of my other favorite um, theologians or fathers of the church, Augustine. And in the Confessions, he says says this of God. He says, you are the beauty of all beautiful things. Mm-hmm. And then he says, like, you are the good of all beautiful things. And I would just add the truth to which all true things point. But the idea is like, hey, we own beauty. We should own art because Jesus is the source of beauty and, and art. And so I'm encouraged, but I want to continue to just press on that one um, to see us awaken, to tell the better stories than, uh, so than Hollywood, or at least those in Hollywood that are Christians to tell that good story. Because I think those things point to the prime story that, you know, all the good stories point to the true story, that. the true myth. Well, we as certainly have say, a lot of people of the in the church here in LA that would be inspired by that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll just ask this closing question yeah. that you maybe have already answered it, but I was just going to ask in connection to what Mike just uh, asked you, is there anything that's like burning a hole in your brain right now that you can't stop thinking about um, in terms of the effectiveness of the Christian witness? Um, yeah, it's kind of related um, to the earlier question um the the question i find myself um so there's there's like actually i can give this at two levels i can give it personally too but like more globally like lord what does faithfulness to christ look like today i mean that's just it's a weird world we find ourselves in right now and and honestly the church is super discouraging in many places i I hope that you guys are encouraged too. i know there's good things happening but like we just look sort of uh, across the country and the behavior of Christians, I guess, it's not always encouraging. And so, Lord, what does faithfulness to Christ look like? How, what does allegiance to Christ look like? Um, but yet with wisdom and things like that. Um, so that's where globally the thing that that stirs me. But I guess it's only because it came into my mind, just to be a little more personal, is I, I've been asking myself, uh, what role am I supposed to play as a leader in this community that God has sort of put mm-hmm. me in, you know, in terms of a mm-hmm. thought leader with respect to thinking about mission, gospel, culture, discipleship, spiritual formation. I, you know, one of the surprises of the book, and there's a few, there's a number of them, but one was um, how, how in writing the book, which was a book about showing the goodness, truth, and beauty of the gospel, it's, and many people have commented on this, it's actually so much about discipleship too, you know, like it's about us. And uh, that was kind of a surprise, but it, like, um, it was, it's nourishing to me to wrestle with these things. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm personally wrestling with like, Lord, what is the role you want me to play in, in terms of um, some of these sort of bigger issues? Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's really what jumped good. into my yeah. mind. Yeah. Discipleship has definitely constantly been on our mind over mm-hmm. the last two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I'm glad you guys are doing this podcast. Cause I think, I mean, it's so crucial for pastors in the church to be having these conversations um and wrestling with it so i'm really encouraged thank by you. what you guys oh, are doing. thank you yeah it's been fun we're learning a lot we are which is which yeah. is really fun paul thanks so much for being here where can people find you online are you on instagram twitter do you have a website or are you smart and stay off all the social medias <laughs> well not on instagram because my kids tell me i'm too old for that <laughs> are you gonna uh, be on so donald trump's new I'm social just media network the world or... uh, yeah are you going to be on Donald What's Trump's that? new social media network? Are you wait, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Although I could point to our lot from my window. But, um, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, not quite. But I, I yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm online. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter. And I've got a website, paul-gould.com. And of course, if you Google Palm Beach Atlantic University, I give leadership to a master's in philosophy of religion program. If you're, and I would just say to your listeners, like if you're interested in these issues of cultural apologetics, the whole master's in philosophy degree that that I'm giving leadership to is structured to go like deeper on steroids mm-hmm. on these issues. And so we're looking at, you know, we it's it's a f- MA in philosophy, and we do everything that you'd want in, in that kind of a class: metaphysics, epistemology, or that kind of curriculum, philosophy of science, philosophy of mind. But all of it's integrated into this sort of public facing posture of how do we connect with the gospel and culture. So we've got a class on public philosophy, one on philosophy and literature, which I'm teaching right now. We actually are just reading through Lewis's philosophy of literature right now. 
um, class on philosophy and technology and all these things. And so anyway, yes. that's all to say you can find us uh, also at Palm Beach Atlantic University in this new uh, MA that, that I'm Amazing. giving leadership. Yeah, we'll link to all that in the show notes. Yep. And uh, would love to, I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you again at some point to have you back on to help us make sense of yeah. other things that are happening. Yes. And especially when you release this other book. Awesome. Yes. Um, so Paul, thanks so much for awesome. uh, chatting with us today, man. It was really, really helpful. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks, Mike and Jake. It was great to talk to both of you. Blessings to you on your work and your church and, and all that you thank guys you do so for much. the kingdom.